I'm Charlotte and I'm presenting the topic comparative metaphorogeomics of the past spheres isolated from transparent and colored plastic debris obtained from joint sampling programs. So essentially, I'm going to be telling you why I use metaproteomics to study the past sphere and why I had to travel all the way to Belgium to do that. So the plast sphere is the community of microorganisms which grow on plastic essentially anywhere. Um, but I study this in the ocean because this is more in conjunction with my PhD. The, uh, the plastosphere can contain many hundreds of different kinds of organisms, microorganisms, um, ranging from bacteria to protists to algae to fungi. And these can all have different functions and different activities which interact with each other and with other organisms in the ocean. This has mainly been studied as um, a source of all these different kinds of organisms. Lots of studies have characterized these plastospheres across the world. However, there's not much study into the activity of the plastosphere as of yet. That is um, apart from two different kinds of studies, which first off look at plastic biodegrading microorganisms, which have been found, found associated with the plastosphere. Um, they express different kinds of enzymes which are associated with plastic biodegradation, although this um, activity in the plastic sphere in the ocean isn't yet characterized. However, this would be very useful in terms of the plastic problem in the ocean, as plastic is, a, as we know, a very persistent pollutant. And so far, there's not too many solutions um, as to getting rid of the plastic in the ocean. The other form of activity that's also been investigated is the activity of potentially pathogenic organisms, so organisms which can cause disease in the plastosphere, but also possibly cause disease to other organisms in the ocean and even um, humans as well, if these plastics are carried to places where they might interact with humans. So this would also be very interesting in terms of um, whether or not plastics are a good or a bad thing, mostly bad, but we'll see. Another form of study uh, associated with the plastosphere is whether or not the plastosphere can grow when on different kinds of colored plastics. Um, so far, um, there is does seem to affect, be an effect of color on the growth of plastosphere organisms in, in the biofilm. However, um, the organisms remaining in the plastosphere um, will probably also react to these different colorants, but this activity has not yet been characterized. So the plastosphere is a very unique substrate um, consisting entirely of plastic uh, compared to other natural substrates. Um, it's also unique, however, because of the different additives that are associated with plastic. So these additives are included in the manufacturing process of these plastics for stability, flexibility, color, um, which um, will then be leached out of the plastic as it enters the ocean. These additives might impact the activity of the organisms binding to the surface of the plastic. Um, however, this activity hasn't been characterized. Um, and this will change from substrate to substrate, regardless of them being in the plastosphere or not. Um, but yeah, this has prompted um, my preliminary test, looking at three different kinds of plastics and the plastospheres which grow on these plastics. So I collected white, transparent, and colored plastics, all of which would be containing different levels of additives. Um, the plastic, with, which is colored, presumably containing the most amount of additives. And then I extracted the community growing on this plastic to look at the activity levels. Interestingly, the plastic with presumably the most amount of additives, the colored plastics, had the least amount of activity, which prompted the question and further study into if there is an impact of additives such as colorants on the activity of the plastosphere. So this um, prompted two studies. So the first study is the impact of all the additives that could be associated with the plastosphere and their impact on singular representative bacteria one at a time. This would have the advantage of being able to find which representative bacteria are most sensitive to the additives associated with the plastosphere. So if potentially pathogenic bacteria are, are detrimented or if 
uh, biodegrading bacteria are even better at biodegrading with additives. We don't know. The other study um, which I wanted to answer, answer this question with was the impact of singular pollutants on the entire microbial community uh, associated with the plastosphere. This would have the advantage of the fact that um, the plastosphere is not, um, the, the microorganisms associated with the plastosphere are not responding to things in isolation. They will be responding not only to whatever or, uh, additives are in the plastosphere, but also to the other organisms and other dissolved organic matter and many other things. So this study would be more representative of a full plastosphere response to, to the copolins. And this would require uh, metaproteomics, and it's also the study that I began with first. So metaproteomics is a part of a long list of techniques to understand what is going on in a microbial community. So starting with a marginally simpler technique, 16S metabarcoding, where you look at the uh, variable region of RNA to understand who is in the plastosphere, who being a broad term for what organisms are there. This is the most common approach so far for plastosphere research. So there's a wide variety of data available on what organisms are currently occupying the plastosphere. 16S is just for bacteria, which is most commonly used, but 18S for eukaryotes is also being more commonly used as well. And then moving up to another form of genomics, uh, metagenomics. This is more of a predictive um, form for uh, predicting the function of what's in the plastosphere. While moving up to proteomics, or in my case, metaproteomics, I can actually see the functional functionality of the plastosphere as each protein is associated with a function. And by matching that function to the bacterial community that's there, I can see who's there and then what they're doing at the time of sampling. So essentially allow me to predict the activity of the plastosphere while um, while exposed to different stimuli. So this is what I did for my first study. I collected transparent plastic um, in Scotland in August of 2022. And then I extracted the microbial community or the plastosphere from these plastics and then re-inoculated that onto pristine plastic. So this is plastic without the additives associated with more general use plastics. I then exposed these microbial communities to an organic UV filter. So organic UV filters are persistent organic pollutants in the ocean, mainly because of their use in personal care products, including sunscreens. So applying the sunscreen before going in the ocean, as so many people do, introduces that to the uh, marine community, including plastospheres. So it's very common in the ocean. Organic UV filters um, also very readily bind to plastic. So it's quite probably found in the plastosphere interacting with all these organisms. EHMC in particular, which is the organ organic UV filter I used in this study, um, has also been found in previous preliminary tests done by myself to have a wide variety of effects on different microbial species. So definitely an interesting uh, pollutant to investigate. So after introducing the EHMC to the microbial community on the pristine plastic, I then collected the biofilm after seven and three days and analyzed them in Belgium. And this is the whole reason why I needed to go to, to UMONS in Belgium because they had a piece of equipment called a mass spectrometer, which is essential for proteomics as it helps you identify the proteins that are in your samples after collection. So this is the flow of my uh, of what I did for this experiment. So starting at the top um, in Sterling, I did the experiment as I just explained there. And then after I performed the experiment, before going to UMONS, I just checked if I had enough proteins for the machine to analyze. Unlike in genomics, I can amplify proteins once I've collected them. 
I have to work with what I've got. And if I don't have enough proteins, I can analyze them essentially. So I checked if I had enough proteins, which I did. And then I also ran them in a gel, which is the black and white striper picture that you see beneath the, the blue 96 well plate. Um, this is actually a gel of the day three exposure um, with and without pollutants. And um, just to see that there is in fact proteins there. So the bands in that picture represent um, a group of proteins of that molecular weight. So after finding that I had enough proteins and looking that they're there, I then took my samples to Belgium for the final sample preparation and then ran it in the mass spectrometer um, doing the spectral analysis with DDA, which is just a standard spectral analysis, and then SWOTH, which is more advanced as you're using a library beforehand to increase the resolution of the spectral data. Uh, once I had received this data in Newmons, I then took this back to Sterling to perform the rest of my analysis. And the biggest hurdle for this analysis was um, actually finding out what proteins I had from the spectral data. And I did this using MPIES, which is um, basically a bit of script created by a previous PhD student, where you feed in the spectral data as well as the metagenomic data, which I also created in Sterling from the nanopore amine ion that we also have at Sterling. And I used this and then it kind of returned a list of proteins that I could then use to analyze. I then also performed a relative quantification using a program called Skyline, which would then compare the amount of expression of proteins between samples. So then I could see how activity varies with and without pollutants, essentially. And this is the data I'm presenting here. Uh, at a cursory glance, because I haven't performed the full analysis yet, uh, I can see that the impact of sample time is actually greater than the impact of pollutant, which is interesting because we weren't in fact looking at the impact of sample time, but there you go. So with the impact of sample time, the early plastosphere is very clearly a lot less diverse than the later plastosphere. The early plastosphere, in fact, contains like 90% uh, a bacteria which is very heavily associated with biofilm formation, especially with plastics, interestingly, but also contains uh, some species which might be associated with potential pathogenicity. While the later plastosphere still contains this organism, but also contains a, a broader mix of other organisms, uh, the activity of other organisms, including that of one which is associated with uh, plastic and general pollutant biodegradation. In day seven compared to day three, there's also a greater expression of defensive mechanisms, particularly from the most dominant organisms. And this is probably associated with the fact that there's greater heterogeneity in day seven compared to day three, and probably a greater chance of species-species interaction, although further analysis needs to be done to confirm this. One thing to note for the impact of pollutant, however, is that there is a greater variation in activity between the replicates when exposed to the pollutant compared to when it's not exposed to the pollutant. So there's uh, the, the data, the spectral data varied between replicates of the microorganisms exposed to the pollutant. This might be a sign of disruption or stress, um, although again, there still needs to be further analysis. But at a cursory glance here, it just definitely seems that the impact of a singular pollutant on a microbial community doesn't seem to be that great, which is why I moved on to my second study. Here, um, as I uh, already evaluated, I was exposing a broad mix of co-pollutants to singular uh, bacterial communities. So to start with this, I had already received a packet of mixed plastics from Southeast Asia. And to release the copolutants to expose this to the bacteria, I irradiated these plastics with UV light so that the uh, copolutants on the surface of plastic as well as within the plastic would be released into the media. 
are then incubated, Rosemarilla aquamaris and E. coli separately with this pollutant containing media. So Rosemarilla aquamaris is a marine bacterium that's actually been found associated with the plastosphere before and is also associated with plastic biodegradation. E. coli, um, everyone knows about E. coli, it's found pretty much everywhere. It's also found associated with the plastosphere, but is not a marine bacterium. So its source is probably from wastewater effluents and it's being carried by the plastics near the effluents uh, to other marine sites. So unsurprisingly, for a bacterium associated with plastic biodegradation, Rosemarilla aquamaris grows very well with plastic additives. Um, in previous studies, it's also grown very well with a plastic uh, pigment, um, which actually prompted this study. I definitely think then that this organism warrants further study. There's actually not been that many organisms found associated with plastic biodegradation or other forms of plastic degradation, let alone both. Uh, so definitely warranting further study. A surprise result, however, is that E. coli does not grow so well with plastic additives, which as an organism which grows well everywhere, um, definitely warrants further investigation. This is where I'm at with this study so far, but um, I'm definitely planning on doing some metatranscriptomics to figure out what's going on here and what exactly is causing this growth and lack thereof in Rosemarilla and E. coli. So to summarize, um, for my first study, the plastosphere is more diverse after allowing time for it to develop. So in day seven compared to day three, it's more developed. Um, singular pollutants only have a marginal impact on plastosphere activity. For my study of um, the host of co-pollutants with single bacteria, my representative plastic biodegrading bacteria responds positively to pollutant exposure, while the representative pathogenic bacteria responds negatively to pollutant exposure. That's the E. coli. Going forward, I'm very close on my first study to finishing and completing data analysis, so I definitely am aiming to produce a paper from this soon. Well, with my second study, I definitely need to do some more experiments and figure out exactly what's going on with these good and bad um, bacteria and their response to uh, plastosphere pollutants. Um, as a whole, for, from both of these studies and from other studies associated with my PhD, I definitely would like to contribute more to the study of plastosphere activity so far, there's only been two studies using metaproteomics to uh, understand plastosphere activity. So it definitely needs to be more, especially since uh, the plastosphere is very heterogeneous in the copolutants it contains, as well as the microorganisms and where it can be located and so on. So there's a lot that can be going on and a lot that can be different. Um, I'd also like to emphasize how plastic pollution is not going away, no matter how hard we try. So it's very important to understand what sort of microbial acti activities we're facilitating by continuing to pollute like we are. So it's my final slide. I'd like to say thank you for listening. Thank you to Mass and for my under other funders for uh, allowing me to present today and to perform my exchange. Thank you to my supervisor in Sterling and for those who helped me with the metaproteomic data analysis and the dissertation students who helped me with the data collection for my second study and especially to the UMONS team who uh, facilitated my exchange and let me into their lab group. And thank you. Great, thank you so much Charlotte for that talk. Um, so we have a couple of questions already coming into the Q&A, but I'm going to leap in first with some questions that I have myself uh, whilst people are typing away with their questions. Um, one is a bit of a terminology question and the word degradation. What, yeah. what does that mean for plastic? Is it just plastic that's getting broken down or is it actually kind of disappearing in a way? Like what is when you're saying it's degrading the plastic? What does that actual phrase mean? Um, 
It, in the current literature, it basically means that the the plastic that so the carbon carbon structure that makes up a plastic is being broken down into into smaller pieces, and that can be more or less difficult for different kinds of plastics. Some some have stronger bonds between the carbon atoms, um, which is why some plastic is more biodegradable than others. Um, but yeah, so essentially, it is the breakdown to smaller pieces. But these are molecular scale at this point. So mm -hmm. at that point, it would just kind of be a source of carbon once it's it's degraded to the, that point that the microorganisms are capable of doing. Uh -huh. OK, great. And um, is there much more information about these two bacteria that you mentioned um, that you're working with um, earlier? Yeah, so the rose morella, as I already said, I'd performed another study on it beforehand where it definitely likes pollution a lot um, while the E. coli is something that's brought in more recently but we've also done some studies um, to one side of this where we've tried to grow the two of them together on one plastic to look at how they kind of battle it out in the plastosphere who wins which which like if the plastic biodegrading bacteria are more prevalent or would be in a, in a more realistic setting or if the pathogenic bacteria win. Because um, we don't know, we, we can see from the studies looking at who's there, kind of who is there, but we don't really know if they're happy there and if the plastic biodegrading bacteria are doing it or if not. So we've simplified it into two and seeing what they're doing. And, and I think that in conjunction with what I've presented today would be quite interesting. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so we've got questions that we're gonna work through in a minute, but if anyone wants to actually drop Charlotte an email, um, her email is on the screen. Please note it down if you have questions that you wanna follow up on um, with her. But the first question asks, why proteomics are not metabolic, but metabolomics? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, it's, it's kind of just the, the technology that we have available to us. Um, a proteomics is kind of what I've started with. And also for this exchange in particular, the collaboration we have, so the, the team you see on screen, that's a proteomic lab. Um, and these ties were excellent before the exchange. So it would, those that mass, mass spectrometer, it can be used for metabolomics, but the calibration in place, which takes a long time to change, apparently I'm not entirely sure, um, is is for proteomics. So it just kind of made, made sense for this place, but it is something I've considered exploring. So it's good. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, the next question uh, says, uh, that was a great talk. Thanks a lot, Charlotte. How did you characterize the activity in your preliminary test? Um, so in the preliminary test, um, the one where I just showed the kind of bar, um, that was very preliminary. So I just used, um, do you mind if I flip through? Um, I just used a gel like I present here where I could see if there was proteins expressed or not. Um, so the, the black and white gel here shows you lots of different bands and lots of probable activity, while the uh, bands for the colored plastics in particular, there's very few bands, while there are more for, for example, the white and colored plastics. So it was, it was more of like a cursory look, but it just made sure that it was something worth investigating at that point. Right. Uh, just a quick question. You know the plastic that you got from that was sent to you from um, the, uh, Asia. Um, yeah. Was it all clear plastic as well, or was it multicolored? No, that was multicolored. Oh, okay. Great. Um, okay. So next question from Jennifer. Uh, for study one in the early plastosphere uh, day three, do you see an enrichment of hydrocarbon degrading bacteria compared to day seven? Uh, Jennifer is wondering uh, where your water samples were taken from and why. So the so the we didn't use 
water samples in particular, I'm just going to answer your second question first. Um, the plastic samples were just beach plastic, and then we extracted the the community from from the plastic. Um, sorry, could you repeat the first part of the question? Yeah, the first bit is uh, in the early plasticer day three. Do you see an enrichment of hydrocarbon degrading bacteria compared to day seven? Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> um, but um, the the enriched organisms in day three compared to day seven. So all of the organisms here, well, mostly are heterotrophic. So technically degrade hydrocarbons, but not not really. The the um, the organisms in day three, which are most enriched, are called are pseudomonas, which are associated with with plastic, but I'm not sure. I, I'd have to check if they're also associated with hydrocarbon biodegradation. Um, but the marine ammonas, which is the gray bars in day seven, um, some of species associated with that have been associated with pollutant biodegradation. Okay, great. And the final question was something I was thinking about myself. Uh, you used a three and seven day sampling time. Do you have any indication of what happens over longer sampling periods? And if you do, or if you don't, are you going to be doing something like that in the future? Um, so there's definitely studies that indicate what communities exist further than day seven. Um, I chose day three and day seven. I actually did the day seven first because this had been shown in preliminary tests to be a good time to extract um, biofilm from pristine plastic. I then did, did day three later because it looked like the biofilm essentially had fallen off at that point. So I wanted to make sure I had enough biofilm from doing by doing the day three sample as well. Um, there's not much invest as I said, there's only two studies using metaproteomics to investigate the activity of the plastosphere. And I'm not sure if either of them have done a time series, but later on, there is definitely different uh, configurations of organisms in the plastosphere uh, compared to early on. So the early on, this is the first week, which I would say is the early plastosphere even though day three is later than uh, earlier than day seven, while well, like mid class sphere is like two to three weeks. And then the late class sphere is about a month and you do see distinct stages, different levels of diatoms, for example, and, and like more stabilized kind of communities of bacteria. But um, yeah, nothing with activity yet, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. That was our final question just uh, submitted into the Q&A box. So if anyone does have um, a question, please do type it into the Q&A. Uh, Charlotte, if you skip to your end slide, then maybe people can also note down your uh, final, uh, your email as well. That's uh, yeah. on your final slide. So please do drop Charlotte a line if you want to talk about anything further. Um, I can't see anything else coming in and you answered the questions that I had written down. So um, that leaves me just to say, and we are uh, finished for time as well. So that leaves me to say thank you very much, Charlotte.